The Gospel of Luke is in a big hurry to get to the temple. It is in a big hurry to get to the law of Moses. The Gospel of Luke is in a big hurry to get to religion, of all things. Immediately following the angels and the shepherds and the there was no room for them at the end, immediately following, there is this. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn shall be designated as holy to the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, two young pigeons. The religious law of the Jewish people is mentioned three times in three verses. That is a lot of times to mention the religious law of the Jewish people in three verses. And this is not just repetition either. Each of these three is referring to a different law each time. First, the law regarding purification after childbirth. Second, the law regarding dedication of firstborn children to religious service. Third, the law specifying appropriate offerings to God. Immediately after the angels bending low, there is this dense, pack Hebrew Bible law. What is going on here? What are we to learn from all this? With stuff like this, it's best taken slow, best done verse by verse, law by law. First, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This first law is is in reference to the book of Leviticus to holiness codes that state that after a woman has given birth to a child, her household is considered ritually impure. She is not able to go into sanctified places and people aren't allowed to come into contact with her either or else they too become impure. Now childbirth is messy and bloody even in a modern sanitized world and certainly it was so in the ancient world. And so for several weeks, for several weeks, a woman would not be allowed to enter into sacred places or be in contact with anyone outside of her immediate family. It would be something like a banishment, setting her outside of community. Perhaps this law is a way of stigmatizing women, stigmatizing women for what is natural, and if what is natural to being a woman is impure, then perhaps women themselves are suspect just for being women. That's what this religious law means at its worst, anyway. But notice what the text says. When the time came for their purification. Not her. Their purification. Mary and Joseph and Jesus's together. The family is setting off for a journey after their purification has come. The whole of the family is set off for a time during this period. Under the force of religious law, people were not allowed to come to see them. They were forced to leave them alone. Mary and Joseph and Jesus, the family, they were not allowed to engage in commerce or serve others or do anything to earn money or even receive visitors. Religious law required that the family be given space and time. Think of it as first century family leave. At its worst, This law is a way of stigmatizing women just for being women. At its best, this law gives space and time when parents and child want nothing in the world besides 
one another. But which one is it, really? Is it really about stigmatizing women or really about giving families space? Which one is it, really? It depends on how it's practiced. Either one is possible. Well, no help from the preacher on that one, so no use dwelling on it. Let's just move on. Let's go to the second law. They brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn shall be dedicated as holy to the Lord. This time it's in reference to the book of Exodus, where it is commanded that the people are to dedicate their firstborn child to religious service. Now this sort of service, this was an honorable thing. This was a desirable thing to be in service to the Lord. There was social standing in it. There was a way to be a leader and shape society in it. There was security in it. But for the firstborn, not the second or third or fourth. Now as a younger sibling, one who is in religious service no less, I'm not sure how I feel about this law. I'm not sure how I feel about this. Perhaps this law is establishing with holy force that it is only the firstborn child who is fit for holy service, the others being pale imitations of the one who broke the mold. That's what the law might mean at its worst, anyway. But notice what the text says. Every firstborn is holy to the Lord. Every firstborn, no exceptions. Whether highborn or low, rich or poor, whether born to the royal family in Jerusalem or to a poor family in Galilee. Every firstborn was dedicated to the same work, the service of God, with all the possibilities that that entailed. At its worst, this law establishes a pecking order among siblings, primogeniture writ holy. But at its best, this religious law is a force for social equality. The service of God becomes a place where the children of the wealthy and the children of the poor find themselves on equal footing with a path toward leadership and honor and security, one that is not dictated, one that is not dictated by their family's wealth or social standing. But which one is it, really? Which one is it in the law, the best or the worst? Depends. Depends on how it is practiced. Either one is possible. No help on that one either, I suppose. Moving on to the third law. Mary and Joseph offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, two young pigeons. This is referring again to the book of Leviticus. When someone was coming to the temple, they were supposed to bring with them an offering of thanksgiving. Something that they could give that would show their gratefulness to God. They were supposed to bring the best of what they had. Spotless bulls from their herd or lambs from the flock or precious olive oil drawn from their groves. They were supposed to bring the best of what they had and put it onto the altar at the temple and burn it so that the smoke would make a pleasing odor before God. Well, they would burn some of it anyway. The rest of it, the bulk of it, would be given to the priests, and the priests would eat it. Now, in a time when meat was a precious commodity, it's pretty convenient that the priests have a religious law stating that precious goods ought to be given to them so they can eat it and that this is going to make God happy. This is pretty convenient. Perhaps this law cynically is allowing holy people to fleece the ordinary simply to fill their own bellies 
all the while calling it God's will. That's what the law might mean at its worst. But notice what the text says. Mary and Joseph brought a pair of turtle doves, two small pigeons. Not much in the way of a feast. To burn this, you would have to burn the whole thing. This young couple from a poor part of the country, they were not bringing a bull or a lamb or precious olive oil, none of which they could afford. They brought two small birds, well within the means of ordinary people to afford. This was what was required of them under under the law, nothing more. The religious law dictated what a person was to sacrifice, and it dictated that it was to be what was to them a meaningful offering. A wealthy person, the king of the nation, they were to have to sacrifice many bowls and barrels of olive oil. A poor person was to do the same, to sacrifice what was to them a meaningful offering. A pair of small birds, And the offering was the same in the sight of God. It was the same in the sight of the religious law, equal in value. Now at its worst, this law is a way for the priests to fleece the people. At its best, this religious law dictates that God shows no preference for the rich over the poor. So which one is it, really? Which one is it, really? It depends on how it is practiced. Either one is possible. These three religious laws, to set apart a family after childbirth, to dedicate the firstborn to God's service, to offer sacrifices of thanksgiving to God. At their worst, they drive people apart, set some people up as better than others. But at their best, at their best, these religious laws bring people together across what divides them unifying them around the worship of God. It is no different today. No different. We have not progressed so very much. It is no different today. Religion, at its worst, is still a tremendous force for driving people apart. And religion at its best is a mighty force for bringing people together around common cause. But which one is it really, religion that is? Which one is it really, the best or the worst? It depends on how it's practiced. Either one is possible. There is no essence to religion. No something out there that dictates for certain what a religion shall do, making it inevitably a force for unity on the one hand or division on the other hand. Such a thing does not exist anywhere. Religion itself is neutral. It is religious practice that makes the difference. It is how people live out their faith that decides whether that religion is for weal or woe. One and the same religion, one and the same religion can by turns be generous and greedy, merciful and brutal, humble and self-aggrandizing, one and the same religion. Every generation, every generation of the faithful must take up for itself the task of tipping the scales one way 
or the other. And so in our piety and in our prayers, we must be vigilant. We must be vigilant that we do not pompously believe that ours is the only right path, but we must also courageously embark on the path of Christ as our own. We must, in handing the faith on to our children, we must, we must be careful not to make them parrot back our own beliefs, but we must be unfailingly honest about what it is that we truly do believe. In our work of justice in the world, we must be careful that power and privilege do not become goals instead of tools. But we also must enter unabashedly, unashamedly, into the muck and mess of everyday life, trying with all our strength, vying with all that we have to make of this world something a bit more like how God dreams it might be. What is religion really? A force for division or unity? We must take up our faith as if that question rests on us. We must take that question up as if this generation shall decide what the answer shall be. Because it will.